Have you ever thought about what causes a church to split apart? Most of the reasons can be traced back to the same thing that causes a marriage to split apart often is a lack of communication. That's too broad. That, almost everything that causes a church to split apart can be summarized in that. But I, what is a reason, specific reasons a church will split? Well, we all know politics has been a big one lately. Um, this wasn't really that much of an issue early in my ministry. Um, I can't remember a single pastor who, who's resigned or a church that pushed a pastor out uh, because of politics up until recently. Um, that's become much more frequent. Some churches split over leadership. A new pastor comes in and maybe he's just not as good as the previous guy. Maybe too many changes are made or a, a church transitions uh, from a, a pastor-led church to an elder-led church. Very few of us like change, so maybe some hate that so much that they start to create cracks in the foundation. Now, I've talked to people uh, who are part of churches that split over their views of gender roles in ministry. Church wars have started over the removal of an organ, the addition of drums, or the changing of pews to chairs. Money's also been problematic. Who, who gets to spend what money? Now, those last few issues are power struggles in the church, aren't they? Who, who's going to be the one that makes those decisions? Who, who is the one that people look to, to to point us in the right direction? You have two groups often. The we like it the way it is group gathers to fight against the change needs to be made coalition and no one wants to give up or give in. Now this is something that I was prepared for in seminary. There is pastoral ministry classes, there are uh, theo theology classes, there's church history, there's Greek and Hebrew and, and hermeneutics, how to read the Bible. There's all of those classes, and there's usually one or two pastoral ministry classes. But we don't often talk about this. The idea that, hey, pastor, before you step into the pulpit, before you take a church, before you go to a church, understand that this is not easy work to lead. Just as it's not easy to lead your own family. I was prepared for theological issues. I wasn't prepared to fight over what kind of bread we use in communion. I'm not here, but I've dealt with that before. I was prepared to defend the authority of Scripture and truths like the Trinity. Now, I'm guessing that I'm just sheltered in a lot of ways. The only debates as a kid that I saw in churches that I grew up in were theological debates. Maybe they happened and I just had, didn't happen to be there, but I remember distinctly as a kid, the biggest battle that I remember the church having was over the charismatic gifts, tongues and prophecies and words of knowledge. Now granted, I was a kid and I probably didn't pay much attention, but I remember this almost as a regular occurrence Someone, some adult talking to another adult about these gifts. Now, this was in the 80s or 90s. And if you can remember back that far in church life, uh, there were some other theological issues that had caused division, especially in the SBC. Entire seminaries had changed over. Professors that were once there in the 80s no longer are there now because of this theological shift. And I'd say in a lot of ways it's a good thing. But what I remember in my church were conversations about the use of spiritual gifts. And in fact, in my hometown, a few churches actually split over this, where you had some leaders who, who came to a different conclusion than some of the church, and the church, instead of saying, hey, we can agree to disagree, they started to fissure and they started to break apart. I don't know how much of an issue this is, though, honestly. But I still hear these things from time to time. And often what I've seen is that lines are drawn and sides are chosen. And what's frustrating, and even as a, a young kid, kids the same age as those that just left, I remember this. I wouldn't say it scarred me, but I remembered. I don't remember a lot of things when I was a kid, but I remember those debates. I remember the anger that I saw on the face of adults. And I remember something else. I remember that they didn't seem to love each other very much. There was debates on who's right and who's wrong, and I'm going to try to convince you that I'm right and that you're wrong. But where was the love in that? And I don't remember that. And that's shameful for Christians 
that I grew up around when I was a kid, that I saw that happening. I saw the anger over theological issues that are not primary, that are not the first tier issues. Love for one another was absent. Our kids may not look like they're paying attention, but they are. I was. And all the more reason that this passage is important because it's pushing us towards a culture of love. Yes, we have a place for disagreements. Yes, we have a place for fighting and arguing and all that stuff. But here, if if all of those debates are not done with the motivation of being loving towards one another, those debates should never happen. And this is what Paul is saying here. I want to show you today how Paul would respond to some of the arguments and fights that we're seeing. Not here in this church, but in the church overall. This morning I hope to show you that the charismatic gifts, the gifts of the Spirit, are things that we should examine and and we should see if they're still valid for today. But I'm going to argue that having the right position on these issues doesn't matter one bit if we're not loving toward one another. And this passage, just six verses, it's not very long. If you look at the the, the first verse in this passage, verse 8, and look at verse 13, you'll see that there serve as kind of bookends, and love is the bookend, bookends for these arguments that Paul is making. Throughout this entire chapter, chapter 13, it's almost kind of this, this thing that's sticking out in the middle because you have a church that's dysfunctional, you have a church that's fighting, you have a church that can't agree on who their leaders are. And then Paul, kind of right in the middle, puts this thing about, you need to love That love must be the motivating factor of why you do what you do. The church in Corinth was fighting, disputing, if you remember, personal rights, freedom, marriage, suing one another, sexual morals. All of these things are happening in this dysfunctional church. What we'll see this morning is that when someone properly loves one another, these issues often fix themselves. See, if a couple comes to me and they're in marital issues and and they're way down the line, I mean, they're one step away from, from getting a divorce, we can trace it back often to certain moments or certain instances where the communication just wasn't happening or where that the love kind of went off the, the side and, and we can trace it back to this thing that compounded and compounded over the years to come to this point where Most people would say it's beyond saving. And see, what Paul is saying in this passage is that if you have love, you're not going to split over issues like these. If you have love for one another and you can agree to disagree in love, you're not going to fight over secondary and third level issues. They just don't matter that much. In some churches, though, we see that people will dig in their heels, refusing to budge on what they think is right. Love doesn't allow for that. Love says, uh, for, love for someone else says, here's what I think is the best course of action, but I'd rather be a blessing to someone than have my own way. The church in Corinth was messy with serious problems, and Paul's antidote to this dysfunction is that they must exhibit Christian love for one another. They ought to devote themselves to something beyond the ordinary way of behaving because this is what, this is what we're taught, right? That, that no, if you're right, if you think you're right, you dig your heels and you fight for what's right. And on the essentials, I absolutely agree. I will literally and figuratively fight you over the Trinity. I will battle you over God's word. I, I will stand my ground and not give an inch These issues that Paul's talking about, these are not the essentials. And we'll see that in a moment too. In other words, to quote 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now, what Paul is saying, now 1 Peter was written after what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, but what Paul is saying, if he could read this passage from 1 Peter, is he said, you hear that? Go act like it. Go act like you've been a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Go act like that you've been brought into the family of God when you did not deserve it. Go act like it. You've been given the greatest example of love. Now show it to others. 
be an example of love that never ends. Now, obviously, we can't love the same way that God loves us. There's absolutely no way that we can do it because God's love is perfect and our love is not. But what we do when we love others is we give them a glimpse, a taste of the love that God has given to us. And in essence, it's a taste of eternity, isn't it? Have you ever thought about that? How you, have you ever thought about the greatest example of love that you could ever feel about another person? Think about your spouse, think about your children. That love is infinitely small, but it's still a taste of the love that God has given to his people. A love that you will experience for all eternity. And to drive this point home, Paul says in verses 8 through 10, that these gifts will cease. Now you say, well, why does he talk about love? And then he goes to spiritual gifts. Now he'll go into this more in chapter 14 the, in the context of orderly worship. But here he's telling us, listen, pay attention to the things that really, really matter. The things that will not go away. He says that love will never cease. Now, I don't know if you thought about this, but the, the three things that he listed in here, these things that are temporary, listen, Prophecies will pass away. Tongues will cease. Knowledge will pass away. One day, whether it's happened before or whether it will happen in the future, people, Christians have disagreed, but the reality is that those things will pass away. Those things are not eternal. Now see, why would Paul include these statements? He includes these things because these gifts do not and cannot contain everything about God. They are helpful, but they're not complete. Verse 9 says that Christians only can do these things in part. So even the best use of these gifts, even the best use of, of tongues and prophecy and knowledge, even the best use of those is still incomplete. Now, many Christians still practice these things. Let's just be honest. There, there are men and women that I love, and you do probably too, that would disagree with, with you on this, or you may have agreement. I don't know. But there are Christians, godly people, who would say, no, these things have not ceased yet. And as I've said before, I take an open but cautious view, meaning that I've never experienced these. I, I've never had these personally. But there are many women who, and men who I respect but what I am certain of, whether or not these are valid for today, what I do know for certain is that most, maybe, of the uses of these gifts are abuses. Most are, are not taking it in accordance with what Scripture says. When you see a TV guy on, you know, guy on TV and he's putting his hand up, he says, put your hand on the TV. I'm healing someone's leg right now. I mean, come on. That's nonsense. YouTube is full of these clips that are the most ridiculous things of these TV shysters going on and saying that they're getting a word of knowledge. No, you're not. You're getting, trying to get people to send you money is what you're doing. I was reading, on the other end of the spectrum, I was reading some sermon notes from a guy who, who I respect who preached through this. And, and he took this passage, though, as kind of his, his way of saying, hey, yes, tongues have ceased. And, and he spent a whole sermon talking about that. Now, maybe they have. However, Paul is not giving evidence for why they have ceased or that they have ceased. Side note, when you read the Bible, don't just take a verse and read it out of context. When you read the Bible, read the verses before, read the verses after, and actually it's even better to read the whole book at one time. You say, why? If I hand you a novel and you flip to page 150 and you read one sentence and you say, well, I know what the book's about, no, you don't. You don't. You have no idea what the book is about until you read the beginning, the middle, and the end. Then it all starts to make sense. So what is Paul saying here when we look in the context of 1 Corinthians, the whole book? He's not so much concerned about these gifts. He's going to deal with those later. They are examples that the Corinthian church would have understood. Think about what's happened already in this letter. They valued the wrong things, haven't they? Now, I'm with Paul. I'm with Apollos. We're all with Jesus, aren't we? I want to do this. No, I want to do this. Let's fight about it. No, you're on the same team. What Paul is saying here, it's not an argument that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased or that they haven't ceased yet. He's saying you're valuing the wrong things. And he's saying at some point, whether it's before or after, at some point these gifts will not be necessary anymore. They're temporary. 
They're partial. They are imperfect. But when the perfect comes, they will pass away. So when the perfect comes, the return of Jesus, there will be no need for these gifts. There will be no need for preaching or pastors. Why not? You have Jesus. Whether you think these gifts are valid for today or you don't, we can all agree that when Jesus returns, the perfect in this passage is the return of Christ. When that happens, these gifts will serve no purpose. Think about these gifts as you would at the Old Testament sacrificial system. Right? Nobody here, hopefully, would say that we need to go slaughter lambs now to appease the wrath of God. Right? That, you can go eat a lamb if you want. But you're not doing it to appease anybody's sins. You're not doing it to cover anybody's sins, right? You're not doing that anymore. Why? Because Jesus came and ended all of that. There is no more need for that. Jesus was the final perfect sacrifice. And so we look at this passage and we say, well, that's kind of similar to what we're saying here, that that these gifts of the Spirit, we don't need them anymore because Jesus is going to return. And when Jesus returns, all of that stuff will be meaningless, not necessary. Similar to what we see in Hebrews 10. Turn with me to that chapter. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. Now remember, up to this point where Hebrews was written, they were still in the sacrificial system. So the the final sacrifice, Jesus, that there were these Jews who still were waiting for the the Messiah to come. and, And Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus puts an end to that. There is no need for that anymore. And the author of Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 10. Verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience of sin? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings... These are, offered, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first order to establish the second. And by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for a time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. This is, first off, this is the gospel. That nothing is good enough but Jesus. This is what Paul is saying, though, in light of what he says in 1 Corinthians, in light of what we see in Hebrews 10. Paul is saying, when Christ came the first time, the sacrificial system served no purpose. When Christ comes again, the stuff that so many people inordinately value will serve no purpose either. We don't need tongues. We don't need prophecy. We don't need words of knowledge. When Jesus comes, because we will have Jesus. We will have the word. And to help the church understand understand this, because this is not easy. This is contentious. This is debateful. I mean, we, we, we argue and discuss these things. To help Paul or to help the church understand this, Paul gives two analogies in verses 11 and 12. The first one is a challenge to grow up. He appeals to a, a parallel of human maturation. He says this, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. The gifts that have ceased or will cease, whatever you fall, they are like things that we grow out of when we get older. I'm going to give you an absurd illustration that next time you go see your medical doctor, you can tell him I said this. So imagine that you're walking in a park one day and you look over and you see um, a 60-year-old man and you happen to see, hey, that's my doctor and he's 60. He's been my doctor for 20 years. And he's playing on a playground that's meant for toddlers. He's swinging. 
He's on the spin thing. He's sliding down the slide with his hands raised, and he's squealing like a child, and he's just running around the playground. He's climbing the stairs on all fours. He's doing exactly what a three-year-old should do, right? You look around for his grandchildren, and he's the only one in the park. There's no other cars. There's no other people. Now, as you start to power walk your way to the other side of the park, what are you thinking? Something's not right. This, this is not normal for my 60-year-old doctor to be playing around like a three-year-old and enjoying himself. The playground was great for a season, great for a time in our lives, but we grow out of that, don't we? It would be very strange to see that happen may cause us to have some nostalgia, but we're not supposed to enjoy the same things we did when we were two or three years old. We grow out of those things. Like I mentioned before, there, this, can, this verse can be taken out of context too, and I've heard sermons about how men shouldn't play video games or dress up for Halloween and all that other stuff. I don't buy into that. And again, that's not taking it in the right context. Paul was not talking about that. Paul was using this as an illustration to say, there are things that you enjoy as a kid that you naturally mature out of, right? I don't put sprinkles on everything like my kids do. I matured out of that, although I do like it from time to time. But, but there is a point, you grow out of those things. A perfect example would be a rattle. You give a baby a rattle, and that thing is like me and you looking at the Hubble Space Telescope, right? They're shaking it, and... But it would be weird if we did that. Strange. You have to grow out of it. In other words, these gifts listed are spiritual toddler toys, necessary at least to some point. Again, we don't agree on the points, but these are necessary for development, but they are not intended to last forever. Second analogy that Paul gives is of someone looking at himself in the mirror. Verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Before the days of smartphones where everyone has a camera in their pocket, high definition camera in their pocket, a comedian once said, this is pretty funny, he said, you can never really know what you look like with sunglasses on. Because it's true, you can't, you're, you're, it distorts what is reality, it dis distorts colors, and, and it distorts what you really see through your eyes because it hides the, the sunlight coming in, right? So it makes it easier to see, but not easier to see things as they are meant to be. Even good photos, even good photos cannot capture the beauty of something. You, you've said this before, if you take a picture of the Grand Canyon, there is no way that you can even imagine how great the Grand Canyon is until you're there. Even the most wide-angle lens photo does not show the glory of the Grand Canyon. The, the, the greatest photographer cannot capture the beauty of the Swiss Alps. You need to go there to see it for yourself. And the gifts of the Spirit are like the photographs that we have access to. They, they, they are, are good, they point us in the right direction, but they're not the real thing. They're not ultimate Gifts of the Spirit are these photographs, so it's kind of the reverse of how we think. Some of you have photo albums. We have some photo albums, not on our computer, but actual pictures. And so you look through those photographs. Why? Why do you keep those? So you can remember what happened in the past. And by the way, every picture that you have is something that happened in the past. You can't take a picture of the future. But every picture that you have is intended to show you what happened, to remind you of what happened. You're taken back in time. Memories come. But as good as those pictures are, they don't do their job because they are not reality. Before digital cameras, all you had was a photograph. And with enough time, that photograph would fade. It would not look like it did three or four decades prior. So we look at these pictures to remind us of things. Now what Paul is saying here in verse 12 is that something similar is happening only in reverse. We look at these spiritual gifts not as a remembrance of what happened, but a, a remembrance of what is going to happen. They are pointers that lead us to the return of Christ. Now a, a better example may be this. You've seen those videos where this, a man proposes to his girlfriend and he sets this long, elaborate, like almost a scavenger hunt kind of thing, or he, 
he goes to a, a favorite place at a beach or maybe on a pier and, you know, for a couple hundred feet, there's hints of what's coming. Maybe he likes candles along the way. Maybe he gets his friends to perform a dance routine. And then it all culminates in him getting down on his knee when his love comes and he says, will you marry me? Now, if you ask the woman who has just been proposed to, the woman who has a new ring on her hand, you say, what matters the most of all of this? She's going to really appreciate the work that he did for her. But she wouldn't trade in all of that to get rid of her husband or her future husband. The future, the marriage is what matters, not the proposal, not the thing that leads up to the proposal. And this is what Paul is saying here. That you marvel at the work that it took to plan this journey for a wedding, but in this case and in Paul's, the journey isn't the most important thing. For Paul, the gifts are important. They are kind of that the flowers leading up the way to the final proposal, but they are not the final proposal. They are the pathway that points us in the right direction. The gifts are important, but they are not the goal. He says at the end of verse 12, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. See, God knows us, and we know him of what he's given to us in Scripture, but we don't fully know. Have you, have you ever thought about this as a believer? When you stand before God, when you stand before the creator of the universe, you're going to see him. You're going to hear him. You get to go, and, and, and I'm not trying to be trite, but you get to go put your arms around Jesus. You get to see your Savior and your King. Have you ever thought about how wonderful that's going to be? Our brains can't even handle that. If we figured this out, our brains would explode. We can't do this. We can't understand this. So we get a glimpse of all that God wants us to know about him is found in Scripture. But we will one day fully know him as he fully knows us now. Now, the final point this morning this is the other book, and so we've talked about love, we've talked about these things that'll fade away, and then we go to the final book in love, which is found in verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. I'm sure you've heard this at a wedding. I'm sure I've said this at a wedding. First Corinthians 13 is really nice. It talks about love. It talks about that, that if you have love, it's the greatest of these, right, that, that we see this. But notice that the passage is not talking about a love between two people. It's not talking about love between a husband and a wife. The purpose is not even to show how love is a wonderful emotion to experience. It is. Paul is saying that faith and hope have no purpose in heaven. Maybe you've not thought about that either. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen. Faith is trusting in something that you cannot see. For the Christian, our eternity is sealed and promised. We have hope now because we trust in the promises of God, but when we are perfected, neither one of these will be necessary. Consider this too. Here's another illustration to kind of help hammer this home. Consider a seven or eight-year-old child in foster care. They have hope. It's the only thing that keeps them going. They have hope that one day that they will have a forever mom and a forever dad. They get bounced around multiple homes, no stability, at least in their hearts, there's not the stability. Certainly foster parents provide great stability, but, but, but in their hearts, they're waiting for that forever parent, that, that forever home, the home that is secure that they know they're never going to leave. What happens when the judge signs those papers? What happens when they go to court and, and the judge says, welcome so-and-so that here is your mom and dad? What happens then? They have security, don't they? They have security. What happens to the hope of that child? Hope turns to reality. There's no need for hope anymore because they have what they had been waiting for. They've been given this gift of a mom and a dad and now they are secure and safe. Christian faith and hope will have no purpose in heaven because everything true will be known and obvious. Everything good will be ours. We hope in what awaits us. It is well, a song that we sing often here, the last verse speaks to this. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, 
The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumps shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. One day, we will have faith that will turn into sight. That what we can't see right now will be perfectly visible to us. Will be perfected and our need for anything else will vanish. The gifts will go away, but what remains? It's love that still remains. And how do we know that? Because what is God? God is love, is he not? God is a lot of things. Holy, certainly, but one aspect of God's character is love. That will never go away. It's part of who God is. And we will experience that perfectly in eternity. So this is kind of the bookends that Paul is writing about. He's not making a a theological case for tongues or for prophecy or for words of knowledge. He's saying this, that none of that matters except for love. Love is what fuels us. Love is what pushes us to go forward. Love is what causes us to come together as a church family. So the question and conclusion is this. Church, how often have we lost sight of what really matters? The Corinthians were being corrected by Paul because they had forgotten what really mattered. Based on what Paul wrote, there were disagreements on teachers, gifts of the Spirit, Christian behavior. I mean, these are basic stuff, at least for us. Chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians is an appeal to the believers of the church to focus on the most important things in life. Rather than spending our time arguing about things that are not eternal, why don't we spend our energy on something that does, something that does last? It's love. Paul argues that love should be the thing that defines our relationships with one another. Peter, echoing the words of Paul, writes this, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. As your pastor, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've said things and done things I probably shouldn't have. I I probably haven't called you enough. I probably haven't visited you enough. I, I, I realize that. But listen, those who know me those who actually have a relationship with me tend to look past my faults. Why? Because they hope that you know that I love you. It's just like your children. You don't stop loving your kids when they do something wrong. You don't stop loving your spouse when they do something wrong. No. Why? Because love covers those things. If we have genuine love for one another, we are able to see past all of those things that we don't like. We're able to see past those things that annoy us. Because we love one another. The heart of the Christian life is love for one another. Jesus says that the world will know us, that we are his followers by our love. Easier said than done. Much easier said than done. It's not easy to love by sacrificing our desires. It's not easy to, to, to feel like loving or to, to love someone when we feel like we're giving in or losing. It's not easy to love someone that you really don't care for. That's really hard, isn't it? This is what makes us different, or at least it should be. My family and I lived in Arizona for three years. It's the start of my pastoral ministry journey. And we were shocked by a few things about Arizona. 120 degree heat was one thing, certainly. People driving with oven mitts on their hands because your steering wheel never cools down. People parking at the end of the parking lot because it's under a palm tree, so it's going to give a little bit of shade. Four months of 100 degree weather, dirt everywhere, scorpions in your home. I mean, these are strange, strange things that maybe should have told us. We should have never lived in a desert. It's warning us. But what shocked me most about Arizona was not those things. What shocked me most were Mormons. Mormons make, uh, uh, there's about 500,000 Mormons in the state of Arizona, making it the largest uh, grouping of Mormons outside of Utah. There are multiple big temples, not just the little churches, but the big temples that Mormons do their marriage and all their rituals and baptizing the dead and all of those things. But the one thing that shocked me more than anything about Mormons was how incredibly nice those people are. They are the nicest human beings in the world, and, and which, which is funny because we had a few nice kids, just a few in our student ministry group, and everyone in their schools thought they were Mormons. And I said, why do they think, well, because we're just so nice. Okay, that's, why aren't they saying, why aren't you a Baptist because you're so nice? Well, we all know that, but, but 
you're, you're really nice, so you must be a Baptist. No one's saying that. They were so generous and so nice to one another. Now, whether or not the Mormons were caring for each other because of an outflowing of their heart or just because I think their faith demands it, e either way, they genuinely seem to care for one another or for other people. Now, here's a question for you. In light of this passage, in light of the idea that love is kind of a motivating factor for everything that we do, are you willing to do for the truth and for love what those Mormons are willing to do for a lie? Jehovah's Witnesses spend a lot of time knocking on doors and sharing their message. Muslims have a list of things that they must do to please Allah. We have standards, certainly, but unlike other religions, our standards can't save us. Our standards are a way to show us, to show the world, that we have genuine faith. Are we willing to, to live for the truth in the same way that so many people are living and giving their lives and giving their time for a lie? question that I think we all have to ask. And, and for the Christian, you have freedom in Christ. You have freedom now so that you can go love one another, that you can love each other sacrificially. Because you can give to one another. Why? My, my riches are not here. My wealth, my, my standing, my status, it's not here. Because just like these spiritual gifts that Paul talks about, that's all going to go away. I cannot take anything with me when I die. But love still remains, doesn't it? Love is the, the one thing that we're going to have for eternity that we can experience a little bit of now. Christian, you have the Holy Spirit that allows you to love well. You have the freedom to love without fear or worry that you may lose your salvation. And this is the point of Christianity. There is nothing that you can do to earn the favor of God, but because of that, now you have the freedom to go out and serve him faithfully. You do not have to make trips to a certain place in the planet. You do not have to pray five times a day. You do not have to eat or avoid certain foods. You do not have to knock on a thousand doors. You do not have to go on a two-year mission trip. You do not have to do those things. Why? Because Jesus is enough. And because Jesus is enough, we get to do some of those things. We do get to go on mission. We do get to tell people about Christ. We do get to love our neighborhood. We do get to serve those in our community. We get to do those things. Why? Because we have the freedom that God has given to us. And this is really what it boils down to. Part of the Christian life, or one of the big components of the Christian life, is that we are loving. And I'm going to tell you this now. You and I cannot do this on our own. There is absolutely no way that you can be loving enough. But when we have the power of the Spirit, when we have God's power in living in us, and this is what it is, God now resides in us. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. This is why Jesus said it's better for me to go and for the Spirit to come because now the Spirit can go everywhere and I can't physically go everywhere. We have the Spirit of God in us as believers Exhibiting perfect love that fi that's found its perfect love in the Trinity is now shown and given to us. This is what lasts. This is what matters. This is what stands the test of time. Tongues will cease. Prophecies will go away. Words of knowledge will end. All of that will end. Preaching will end. Sermons will end. Bible studies will end. Why? Because we're going to have Jesus in front of us. But Paul says that love does not end. Love does not fail. Love does not go away. So church, I encourage you, let this be a taste of the love that God has given to you because guess what? We will be loving one another forever. We'll be loving the Lord forever in perfect love. I challenge you this morning, think of those instances that we can, we can be more loving to one another, beginning here but going out of these doors because the world will know us by our love. Would you pray with me?